Hello, everybody. We will just wait a couple of more minutes to give the chance for everybody to join before we begin today's workshop. I guess we're ready to begin. Hello, everybody, wherever you are around the world. So welcome to another one of our online uh, series on uh, security and trust in the financial services. For this one, we have the pleasure to co-organize it with colleagues from City University of London. In addition, we are planning together to hold a couple of more online events in related topics before the face-to-face -face conference that will be held in December of this year in London. So save the dates for December 15 and 16 for FinTech and Open Banking. A recent study by IBM states that uh, financial services are the most targeted by cyber criminals for several years now. Of course, all of these attacks impact more than just money such as eroding trust with customers, threatening the financial firm's reputation, and of course also endangering not only customers' money, but also their data. So today we have with us four experts in the area of financial services and security that will provide us with their insights on the state of their technologies that can assist in mitigating some of these uh, problems. We will start today's session with a presentation by Dr. Theodosis Mouroussis, followed by Prof. Raj. Then Ms. Julia George and Dr. Beriglis uh, Thiveos will join the party for a panel discussion. And of course, at the end, we will be also taking your questions. I was, uh, so we are starting now with a presentation by Dr. Mouroussis on the transformation of the financial sector through blockchain. Theodosis is a cryptologist and information security professional with, with strong interest in both academia and industry. A Cambridge and UCL graduate, he was the first recipient in the UK Cyber Cyber Security Challenge in 2013. Theodosis is the managing partner of Electi Consulting, a consultancy specializing in blockchain, cryptography, and artificial intelligence. Theodosis, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Zulla, for, 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 for the intros. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, it's visible, right? All good. So yeah, thank you for the intros and, uh, and thank you for, for inviting me to this like very important seminar today which we are going to focus more on the applications of blockchain in the financial sector as professor sulla luca mentioned my interest is in cryptography and as a consequence in the blockchain and blockchain applications background in mathematics and then cryptography and i have worked with many big organizations governments and universities are, are around educating for blockchain, but also applying blockchain to different industries. I'm a managing partner at Electi, and I also advise a lot of uh, universities. I'm also uh, with the uh, University of Nicosia lecturing the, the cryptography course, and I'm also advising other universities ab abroad, uh, like London Business School and uh, Cambridge University. Okay, before uh, I focus into the real applications in the financial sector, I would like to make you a short, very short recap regarding evolution of money and how blockchain naturally uh, arise through this evolution. As you know, uh, people, uh, they started thinking of ways to transact, and the first method of transacting was uh, all around bartering, where people were exchanging an item for another item. As you understand, this does not scale, 
and uh, you are not in position to conduct international trades or conduct trades of, of, of any type. So then the next imminent uh, need for being in position to facilitate transactions to make our everyday, everyday life easier was through standardization. That's why they said, okay, let's say that this coin uh, from this medal worth this value and uh, defining this way some uh, standardized uh, items that can be used for, for exchange in order, for example, to acquire food or acquire land or acquire anything. After this, we have the metal coins and paper money that came into surface. And then because of uh, lots of advancements in the in electronic space mainly, we have the in invention of credit and cash systems. And as a consequence, electronic payments through point of, of, point of sale systems. And then having the internet in place, uh, we were in position to start conducting transactions at, at, at an international level. And we have e-cash systems being developed so that we can pay through like uh, internet, for example, PayPal. Fortunately, uh, like a decade ago, we have something called Internet 2.0 that came into surface, which is all about blockchain uh, based enabled transactions, which can be seen as we are gonna see as another layer on top of the internet, while internet can be used to exchange information, blockchain and internet will allow us to transfer value through this uh, public network, okay? And now we don't have to discuss uh, and convince anybody that blockchain is very, very important. We already know this, as you see here from JP Morgan, for example, says that blockchain is laying foundation for digital money. And they said that 2019 will be remembered for the rise of digital money. And the groundwork is now in place for more mainstream adoption of blockchain technology at the same time that the foundation is being established for the development of digital currency and fast payments. And if you search online, you are gonna see that many governments actually started announcing that they are interested into the digital currency space. And many of them have already run several proof of concept how digital money will be and uh, how to eliminate 100% paper money and focus on getting digital money. Undoubtedly, this new transition from paper money to and like legacy systems that are being used for transactions and moving into digital money will be enabled by blockchain technology. Nobody else now says that this is not the case, okay? And thus the use of, let's say, cryptocurrencies, if we call them, or tokenization methods or blockchain-based transaction system is inevitably the future uh, of the payment. However, before it goes mainstream, uh, as others, uh, as we're going to discuss later also, there are many challenges that we still need to be addressed. And some of them have already been addressed or there is a, a lot of progress being made on, already. For example, uh, uh, the ability, how we deal up with completely anonymous uh, tokens, how we conduct KYC, AML, and how do we deal up with this type of volatility. In regards to adoption of blockchain-based transactions and uh, cryptocurrencies, we have something called exponential adoption curve. As you see here, this is from 2019. Already in 2019, we had 81% of Americans being familiar with at least one type of cryptocurrency. Two years later, you know the example of El Salvador that became the first country to accept Bitcoin as a legal tender, which means that if you go to El Salvador, you can pay everywhere with Bitcoin pretty much, or you can withdraw money uh, using your Bitcoin wallet. And it seems that blockchain now, it, it follows this exponential trend. This is the size of the Bitcoin blockchain from January 2019 up to September 2021. And nobody can actually doubt that there is a lot of interest and that uh, there is a lot of work being done behind, let's say, Bitcoin and the adoption of this uh, system uh, grows up exponentially. Okay. Let's see now how the inception of the blockchain uh, came into the surface. We are gonna focus on applications in financial services, but it's good to understand why actually uh, this community or 
person called Satoshi Nakatomo came up with this idea. It all started when a bunch of anarcho-capitalists who embraced the idea to have a currency not issued by a state that could be exchanged freely without the need of any financial institution. So the main idea, as you know, was to remove any middlemen, either unnecessary ones or ones that we are controlling, let's say, in a not very uh, democratic way, the, the money supplies. Okay, and why this uh, blockchain appeared and Bitcoin protocol is the protocol that can be used, uh, that, that, that gave rise actually to this explosion in regards to blockchain research. It's because this the result of this Bitcoin as a result, it's the result of 40 years of ongoing research in regards to cryptography, in regards to uh, distributed systems, game theory, economics, and many others. As you see here, I'm not gonna analyze uh, each like uh, line that you see here separately. But uh, what I want you to understand is not that this Bitcoin paper actually have been invented in a year. It's the result of combining several very prominent results uh, from like eight from the 80s era. If you want to understand more blockchain into fr from a technical perspective and application perspective, these are the three guys that you could follow. David Cham, the father of digital currency, uh, DigiCash was the first application. Adam ha Black, Black, who invented the hash cash technique, which is a method that allows to come into consensus in a distributed setup. And Scott Stornetta, who actually developed blockchain, which is this ledger, the distributed ledger. So blockchain has not been developed in the Bitcoin paper, blockchain pre-existed. But using blockchain with all the other technologies like hash cash and other techniques, uh, it's the first time that we see this elegant combination that completely solves all the problems in the Bitcoin protocol. Okay, and Bitcoin protocol has been developed as a need for a pure peer-to-peer -peer digital currency that will not require a third party, cut unnecessary middlemen and trust the code, meaning that the power belongs to the majority. This is completely auditable and it's something that we can go and check. Okay, and this uh, this is what has been written in the first block of transactions, block zero by Satoshi Nakatomo team, uh, which was a message that this is pretty much might uh, substitute the banking sector. This is the, precisely the reason they invented Bitcoin to bring of second bailout for banks. Okay, more interesting uh, ideas regarding Bitcoin, you can go and search into the, and read the paper, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system that describes uh, exactly how the network ran and what is the logic. Okay, so just uh, one uh, few seconds to describe this blockchain idea so that we can see how can this apply it. So the whole idea is that there is a ledger there is a database that records transactions among participants over a, a, an ecosystem. Everything is coded. The way decisions are being taken is coded. The way we agree on stuff is being encoded. And when a transaction or action is initiated by any node, this is propagated over the network. All these set of transactions or actions is being populated into a block miners or other people validators validated transactions and then append this to the previous transactions and the way we have this uh merging of the cubes as you see here that are the blocks happened in a method called cryptographic ceiling which is a technique that ensures that as soon as something has been connected to the previous blocks in order to change something at any level you need pretty much to go and alter the entire history. And because of the techniques deployed and of the cryptography that is being applied, this turns out to be impossible to do in practice. That's why we say that blockchain is uh, immutable. Properties of the blockchain, decentralization, we are talking about a distributed and decentralized system, no single point of trust and thus no single point of control, Audit auditability, this chain of cubes, this chain of blocks, as you see here, is public. Anyone can go and inspect and see the transactions. And that's why every they will have the property of accountability, because by just auditing the, trans, the, the, the ledger, you can understand what is going on and trace the transactions. Construction of direct trust, because unknown parties can operate without the need of third party intermediation, elimination of single points of failure, for the obvious reason and secure because we have 
strong and novel cryptography being deployed in order to guarantee the properties that we would like to have into the ecosystem. For example, immutability, confidentiality in some protocols, uh, uh, privacy, anonymity, etc. Reliability, resistance to outages and manipulation, finality, because all the members of the network know which is the true state. And before, after Bitcoin, we had the Ethereum that got the idea of the smart contracts, embedded this into the blockchain and gave us frameworks and ideas now how to use blockchain, not just for transactions, but use blockchain with smart contracts in order to eliminate uh, inefficiencies that we have in systems by encoding everything into smart contracts and allowing multiple parties to avoid mal uh, complex communication protocols to come into an agreement and use the same platform, which is blockchain based. Okay. Transparency because everything is public, immutability because of hash functions and cryptographic sealing techniques being applied to ensure that nobody can alter the transactions as soon as these transactions have been approved by the community and have been appended into the ledger. And ownership because uh, only through something called the private key, anyone is responsible, is, uh, is allowed to make a transaction that involves the wallet of this uh, private key. Okay, and operation streamlined and the unnecessary middlemen being removed through computational logic and through smart contracts. Okay, the idea of certain protocols that are proof of work base is that the majority always wins and everything is being uh, public and uh, audited and stored in public circuit ledger called the blockchain. Okay, the reason that Bitcoin uh, actually was the first who achieved to become mainstream in regarding uh, being used for applications in uh, financial services in transaction is because actually Bitcoin was the first to address how to solve these three main issues, no counterfeiting, no double spending and transaction irreversibility and immutability by using several techniques as we've seen before. I'm not gonna focus on this because our aim today is more about the financial services, but it's good to give you some properties because uh, these are important properties to understand why they are useful to use in the financial sector. So 2008, Bitcoin uh, published, one year later, open source project and became like, started becoming mainstream. And however, there is still lots of controversy characterized as international currency by some, other people say a bubble, other people say a store of value, it, and there are, this is how it, uh, it's, it fluctuates in terms of value, in terms of price, quite volatile, but uh, we don't know, I mean, uh, we, I cannot give you an answer regarding this. What I can say definitely is that more and more financial institutions are interested to get into the Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain space, uh, etc. Okay, and this is like the coinmarketcap.com, which shows that there are more than one project now <laughs> regarding uh, applications of blockchain and regarding building blockchain-based ecosystem. And if you go on this web page that you, I'm definitely, I'm sure that you know, don't uh, get surprised by the prices. These prices are not the today's prices; are for a few months ago. Uh, this. Uh, it's like the portal like Bloomberg we have in financial services. This is the portal that exists for the blockchain-based uh, financial ecosystems. Okay. Regarding if uh, this is a, a hype or cope, we expect and we have already seen signs that confirm this like a uh, curve that you see here, where it's pretty much split into four uh, cases. We have the stealth phase where people realize from very early stages that this technology is quite prominent. They start investing this. And then we have institutional investors because of the awareness phase and more people understand the value. And then it goes to the mania phase where we have the retail, the public gets crazy about this new technology. They invest lots of money. And then as you know, something cannot go always up and up and up. It has to go down at some point. And we have something returned to the mean or regression to the mean which is the, the, the final state where we have uh, real applications only surviving that add value either to the real economy or to the use case that we would like to apply it. Economists characterized blockchain as the last machine and they said that blockchain will do for transactions what internet did for information. 
and that in turn allow for free flow of information while blockchain will allow for, for trust. And we have more and more money being invested into the blockchain space. Deloitte projects that by 2025, we're gonna have 12 trillion of dollars being injected into the blockchain space. And Morgan Stanley said that only for supply chain, blockchain is a half a trillion dollar opportunity in the US only. And why is that? Because uh, supply chain is a very complex scenario that involves multiple stakeholders that need to agree on specific states, which is a moving part. Uh, and that's why blockchain, uh, if all these entities are onboarded on a blockchain based platform, it will allow them to reach to finality much earlier than, than using legacy systems. Okay, this is something very useful. It's a flowchart that explains when you need a blockchain and if you need what type of blockchain you are using. And this is what I'm uh, always following when I advise my clients. First of all, I need to understand the project. And first of all, I need to understand what type of data flows are being involved and if there is trust among the stakeholders or not, and who needs to have access. If you answer these questions, you will understand if you really need the blockchain and what type of blockchain do you need? Do I need a blockchain where I will onboard companies that know each other? Then I, I use something called private blockchain. Do I need something that no, no one knows anybody, but they need to reach into agreement? Then I use a public blockchain. Or do I need something governed by set of companies or set of governments, and anyone will be uh, in position to access and audit it? We are talking about hybrid blockchain. So now we are not in 2010. We are in 2022, like 12 years later. We know what is the value of the blockchain. We know what problems can be solved and we know what type of blockchain we can use based on the application of interest. What we've said before, we've said that there is something called the ledger, which is the blockchain and everything is being recorded. If you go to blogexplorer.com and like play around with this visualization dashboard, you will see the, this thing that I've been describing before regarding chain of blocks that include transactions. What does this mean? It means I can go and inspect all the transactions. And because transaction means one address sending an amount to another address, I can go and trace everything and I can see what other transactions have been done before. And I can see uh, correlations among different public addresses, for example, okay? In financial services, if everything is masked like this, it will not, we will not be in position to protect investors, for example, or, or to trace transactions. That's why transaction forensics becomes a very important but difficult task in the blockchain space. Even though everything is transparent out there, uh, the persons that are conducting the transaction, there is no leakage of information at any point of the, of the protocol. However, if we, are, if we have to investigate a financial fraud, then we need to trace the transactions. Nowadays, there are some tools that can help us to actually trace the transactions. For example, Chain Analysis or CoinFirm, they provide such platforms. And what do these companies do? They go and collaborate with certain entities that collect the transactions, for example, tax departments in certain countries, centralized exchanges that need to go to KYC AML to, the, to, the, to their users. And by just combining this information with the public information available on the, on the ledger, they can draw some uh, like um, correlations, some graphs as you see here, and maybe attach some type of risk to specific transactions. And this is a very helpful tool nowadays that is recommended by all governments that allow crypto related business in their countries. For example, in Cyprus, we recently uh, allowed people to come and set up their crypto exchanges, but the regulator asked them to have such a tool in order to be in position to investigate the transactions. Okay, uh, this is because Blockchain now comes to be, be integrated into the financial sector and the regulator bring us the expertise and uh, that is being required in order to ensure that these uh, transactions are not violating any of the rules of the economic system. However, there is a problem with the privacy preserving technologies, for example, Monero or Dash that are fully anonymous the, that's impossible. And the only, maybe the only way to do this is through, I don't know, maybe banning at a, at a large scale, or uh, there is no any other way to, to regulate and understand the transactions 
and the transaction was like a forensics of, of, of privacy preserving tools because such tokens they offer privacy and anonymity at origin level you don't know from where the transaction came you don't know where this transaction ended up and you don't know what was the value of the transaction everything is anonymous and this is pretty much a headache for the regulators because around the world there is a discussion if they are gonna use blockchain or not but there are still cases that might uh, not be solved because it's impossible like these are uh, fully anonymous tokens also there are some other services online mixers for example if you want to hide your tracks using bitcoin you can go to such a mixer service and what does this mixer service get does they get a batch of transactions from different people and instead of directing them from the origin to the destination they obfuscate them and you cannot see the tracks this will make problems with a money laundering uh, problems for example okay but the such mixer exists and we have as i've said before fully anonymous uh credentials like monero verge Commodo, zen cash and many others uh, regarding applications now there is a lot of tendency using blockchain based uh, products for the securitization sector to allow faster liquidation of illiquid assets and uh, all polymath for example if you go and search for Polymath, is is positioned as the security token platform. I, I can go into the po Polymath platform. I can select my evaluators that will evaluate my business plan, evaluate my asset. I can select lawyers. I can uh, ask them to help me tokenize my project. Everything will be on the blockchain. I know that there are legit contracts around. And this uh, blockchain can be used through the Polymesh blockchain to launch securities. And they have also numbers that can be used to be purchased from the ICL numbers, for example, that can be used to purchase from other countries. Uh, there is a, still, there is no killer app in the security sector for the blockchain, but at some point, some company will succeed in actually uh, making more useful the application for blockchain in the securitization sector. We have countries that have used it, for example, real estate tokenization, which is a, like, a, like a very big uh, uh, topic in, 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 in finance. In general, we see this trend from Web 2.0 applications to Web 3.0 applications. And the whole idea here is to decentralize the traditional client server architecture. So the whole idea, instead of having one company just hosting all my data and allowing me to interact with my data or, or interact with other people's data, for example, viewing them like in Facebook, I remove the client server architecture and I replace the whole system with smart contracts and blockchain. And this is inevitable to happen at some point. Now we are still in experimental phase, but I believe at some point the browser is going to be fully decentralized. We have Brace. Social media will be fully decentralized and all the web 2.0 applications that involve people generating data uh, and uh, like uh, interacting with data will shift towards a web 3.0 architecture, which is fully decentralized and distributed. Smart Chainers is a company, for example, that allows you to tokenize several assets uh, in the securitization sector, like fine arts, NFTs, if you have seen, antiques, land, technology, gold, mines, real estate projects related to oil and gas, for example. Uh, you can use this type of blockchain along with Polymath, for example, for, for uh, tokenizing such assets. And you can deploy this at any level of assets that you want. The only thing is to use such platforms, verify the ownership through legal contracts in this case, and map the, the, the real world into a digital tokenized world. You can use blockchain in the financial sector for different applications. For example, you can create new payment tokens like stable coins are very popular nowadays. And we have uh, like uh, countries that are experimenting in building uh, stable coins. And we have big banks that are experimenting building uh, stable coins. Such stable coins will allow us to map the money into the digital form and will allow us to get faster and uh, less expensive into the digital asset space. And this, we have also central bank issued digital currencies. All the central banks, if you search for UK, for example, RS coin was the paper that have been tested for building the UK national token on it. 
We can build utility tokens, uh, tokens that represent value into an ecosystem and allow us to interact with an ecosystem. And we can build QR utility, sorry, security tokens. For example, tokens representing bonds, equities, uh, commodities, derivatives, asset ownership tokens, tokenized assets, investment tokens, revenue sharing tokens. You can encode the tokens so that it distributes you back dividends, profit sharing, and whatever you want. From a technology point of view, we have most of these tools. What remains is for these use cases to become more mature and being used in the proper way and facilitated properly by the regulator of each country. And if we have these tokens, we are allowed to do something called token offering, used to be called ICO in the past, which is simple, is, is, is like the reverse of the IPO, which means that I can tokenize my asset, I can sell it, and then I can still work on, on, on my project. Okay, except of ICO that you have seen 2017, STO is something that we expect to become more and more popular in case we have killer apps in the securities industry. It's similar in terms of technology, but it's much stricter in terms of regulation because you have to be regulated. Companies experimenting with the blockchain space in the financial sector, we have MasterCard that released a blockchain-based API with the ability to send money over a blockchain and can be used also for provenance of luxury goods. For example, if I buy a Louis Vuitton or Hermes back, uh, then this can go through the blockchain. And next time when I want to resell it, for example, I have the proof on the blockchain. R3, release the Corda framework that can be used uh, for payments and instant transfers. Ripple have a native blockchain that acts as an exchange network trying to replace the SWIFT protocol used by the banks and SWIFT at the same time using blockchain as a proof of concept to reconcile their international accounts in real time, optimizing the global liquidity. JP Morgan have built a blockchain-based interbank information network. And we used to have Calibra in the past. Now it's, uh, it's not uh, functional anymore. Facebook came up and say that I, I will release uh, digital currencies over the platform and we will have our native token called Libra coin that will allow Facebook users to interact, but this is a dead project now. Okay. Other applications of the blockchain technology, internet of things, banking applications, payments, cybersecurity, intellectual property and copyright, because blockchain is tracking records from source, anyone can have a unique and changeable proof of existence of a given record at a given time and creators can be directly paid by the users without intermediaries. Blockchain identities, our blockchains in the future, our identities in the future will be on the blockchain and I'm gonna have just a wallet which will have all my necessary documents in it, binded also by my identity. Blockchain also can be used for voting, for companies, for example, or government voting. Taxation. This is a project that have uh, been suggested also at the EU level, having all the countries on boarded on a single taxation system and tax can be applied directly at the point of sale. And because of the mutability of the, of the ledger, I know exactly what are the taxes. There is no tax evasion anymore if this technology is being applied. Something which is very popular now in the financial space, it's something called a DeFi, Decentral Finance, which is an umbrella term for a variety of applications and projects in the public blockchain space geared toward disrupting the traditional finance world and inspired by blockchain technology. So DeFi, it's, uh, it's like an, uh, the term that covers all the applications that we have in the financial sector, but using blockchain space. And as you see here, we have exponential interest in the DeFi space, 9.47 billion being locked into particular protocols here. And uh, this is something that becomes very prominent because now we have lending algorithms, uh, lending based products. Uh, we have decentralized hedge funds. We have uh, market making products. Uh, we have automated market makers. We have an effort to map all the existing uh, instruments that we have in the financial sector into the blockchain space. Another application is that of NFTs. For example, uh, what is an NFT? It's a non-fungible token, which is unique and non-interchangeable. And this can be used to represent video, audio, shares in a company, or, or, or any, anything that I can describe and it's unique. And as you see here, uh, I mean, there is also exponential adoption into the NFT space. 
here you see some examples of the most expensive uh, NFTs. Okay. Now, regarding of the blockchain, let's say that you would like to run a blockchain project into your company for a particular use case. The most important thing is to navigate through the flowchart I have provided to, to you before and understand what uh, are the main uh, problems that we are trying to solve. But in general, we have the public open blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and we have the private ones that are blockchains, uh, which are governed by a group of companies, for example. These are very popular in cases that I know there is trust among the companies and I need to speed up on the way they are interacting. In this case, I need a public blockchain. But if it has to do with securities, for example, and making securities accessible from any part of the world, then we're talking about using the public blockchain, okay? However, so far so good. We've said that blockchain enable us to modernize the financial sector and make us believe more into the financial sector now, but still it's code. There are, it's a new technology. It's very dangerous in some cases. You see here 22 million drained from compound contract. If these money are lost, they are lost. You will never find them again. And since most of the projects are open source, we have many companies, many people working on such projects. Uh, the, it's inevitable to have bugs in some cases. And that's why we have many different attacks and many money being lost. That's one of the main reasons why actually blockchain has not became fully mainstream on the financial sector because of problems that exist. Okay. Security, it's a major concern when we want to apply financial sector uh, products into the blockchain in space. It's very important that we need to understand that everything, all the assets are binded with a specific private key, which if I lose, then I lose the assets. That's why we have a, an evolution of companies that started working on the problem of protecting these keys. And we have, for example, different type of wallets, hardware wallets, paper wallets, desktop mobile web wallets that can be used. And we have custodian services now that can use more advanced techniques like multi-signature to protect our assets. For example, if a, if a bank will allow people to be exposed into the Bitcoin asset, they will not just have a key uh, stored somewhere. They employ custodian services that apply very strict conditions when to access these funds. What does this mean? It means that they say that I have these five officers that if you want to unlock your bitcoins, these five officers, three of them need to agree and need to go to this building which is very secure uh, and commit their key shards in order to unlock the funds. Okay, and crypto custody solution, is, it's a very important topic. If you want to run projects in the financial sector, you always need to have a custodian in, uh, uh, helping you in order to uh, set up a proper secure infrastructure. While if you are doing self-custody, there are also other wallets that can help you to do this. Uh, lastly, we have crypto exchanges that are acting like banks, for example. They facilitate swaps from one token to another. And we have two different types. We can have like a centralized one, like Binance Coinbase, but we have, can have also DEXs. Decentralized exchanges, for example, like Uniswap and any other type of exchanges. Okay. As I said, centralized versus decentralized exchanges. And in general, we have the blockchain startup landscape increasing a lot. As you see here, there are many, many applications and many of them are into the financial sector. For example, we have payments, we have identity, governance, exchange, trading, investing, legal audit and tax, uh, wallet infrastructure, data provenance, prediction markets. There are many uh, different applications in the financial services now using the blockchain space. Okay. Uh, and uh, startups can use tokens in order to actually do something called token offering and raise money to build their products. First ICO was uh, Ethereum, very successful back then. One Ethereum was 30 cents. And uh, you see how much gains you can make if you predict and if you organize a, a, a good project. Okay, that's it from my side. I hope you enjoyed and thank you. If you have any questions, maybe now or later, we'll be here. Uh, thank you, Theodosi. There are a couple of questions that uh, are 
directly for you, I believe. So I will not leave them till the uh, panel discussion. Um, so for example, there is one, uh, it's the, it says question relevant to public versus private blockchains. Can we say that a public blockchain is cheaper to operate but need a good incentive to be maintained? Whereas a private blockchain has operation costs which needs to be funded by a consortium of actors with common interests? Very good question. Uh, the answer is not, it's not straightforward. It really depends on the project and where you are gonna build it. Cost-wise, if you are running a public blockchain, it means that you need to buy some cloud infrastructure, use managed services of a blockchain, have a cloud cost every month and, and infrastructure cost that you have to build this. In case of the public one, it happens that the cost of development initially, it's uh, not very prohibitive, it's much lower, but not very flexible to change anything. Okay, and it depends on the price. There is a lot of valuation because if you want to push transactions, you have to pay fees. Okay, and you don't know what's the price and if it's low or whatever. Okay, but it's not cost the problem here. The problem to decide if public or private one is about understanding if you have trusted or untrusted uh, parties that will govern the system. Thank you, Delasi. Another one for now, and then we will proceed with our next uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Uh, what uh, would be the impact of uh, quantum computing on the security of the cryptocurrencies? Mm -hmm. Okay, quantum computing, when it comes, uh, it will break the public key infrastructure, which means that the elliptic curve that is being deployed for private and public key will not uh, be secure anymore. Hash functions will be secure, okay? But uh, regarding this, the architecture so far are quite modular and we will be in position to migrate to these new PKI systems without uh, having our security being violated, but we're far away from this to happen. I mean, still we don't have a vision quantum computers. Uh, thank you, Dodo. See, there are some more questions, but I think it's better if we leave them uh, towards the yes. end. So uh, now then I will ask uh, Prof Raj uh, to take uh, the floor. And uh, let me please say just a few words about Professor Raj also. He's the uh, founding director of the Institute for Cybersecurity at City University of London and uh, the CEO of City Defense Cybersecurity Solutions Limited. Raj experience are in the area of, uh, crypto, uh, of encrypted search in big data, privacy preserving data analytics and trusted data sharing in heterogeneous business sensitive environments. He has published more than 350 conference and journal papers, four books and holds two patents in the area of cloud big data, privacy and uh, security. So Professor Raj, Oh, let me. And your camera, please. Yes. Does it allow me to get the camera on for some sure. reason? Sure. It says the host has stopped it. So somebody is blocking me from using the camera. Um, Valentino, are you around, please? The uh, share. Yeah, it's no. fine now. Okay. And this sharing should be enabled also. Okay. Very good. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. And no okay. worries. So good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> good morning and good evening. Based around, I see there are many of you from different parts of the world. Uh, Welcome to this uh, seminar and thank you to Sola for inviting me. Uh, obviously, I'm part of City University of London. I'm a professor of security engineering at City University of London. Uh, City is my home ground. I have been, uh, unlike Theo, I have been here for the last 32 years for good or bad. But I will show the journey that I've taken for the last 25 years in terms of 
what is digital identity and why digital identity is important going forward for things like the financial services sector. So the, the presentation will give a outline and I think Theo has touched on some areas uh, that are important for digital identity. So thank you Theo for it. Uh, so I'll give you a basic form what it means of identity and what are the different forms of identity, uh, different identity management systems, uh, privacy versus identity, and then going into some of the future of identity, what it, it looks like, talking around open banking, continuous authentication, uh, zero trust architecture, and the internet of things. So the, let's look at identity problem of today. So if you look at it, this was a slide that people used in 2000 and we are 2022. And still it is true that the best thing about the internet is they don't know who you are. And this actually blocks us from doing many of the trustworthy things online. So somehow we need to find a way of identifying people online. So we are going to look at how we transformed our identities going from, you know, even starting in year 2000 and going in the last 20 years, what have we done and where we are today and how we are going to support these through the next generation of digital identities so that we can use them within open banking. So some of the current challenges of digital identities because they were built or internet was built. So the communications anonymous and we have different in-house or multiple networks, which are incompatible, which creates the challenge. Then we tend to create multiple identities. Then as humans, we are sometimes not capable of handling multiple identities. Uh, I know many people still write the uh, passwords uh, and just stick it on a sticky note. And we haven't changed our behavior. We are still very prone to using, you know, paper written uh, credentials. And criminals obviously love to exploit this mess. So we have multiple forms of identities and there are criminals who make use of these identities and we tend to be fluid and we tend to have multiple identities online. So this is a big challenge when you go into the financial services sector, which is highly regulated there are so many new regulations coming in for data sharing and protecting the individual's privacy in terms of their personal data. So how do you protect these identities within such financial services sector? So obviously, starting from the 80s, there was you know, one ID, which you know, I come from the generation, many of you may not. Then moving from that mainframe to client server, we had the internet and then the mobility had, and we started having so many email IDs and then companies like Yahoo and Google tried to block us in terms of having multiple identities. So we still found ways to bypass and create multiple identities. Then we expanded this, as Theo mentioned, going from web 2.0 to web 3.0, where we you know, became more decentralized. And then we started having more interaction through business to business, business to customers, and it just started growing into more B2B, B2C environment in the 2000s. So we just have, starting from one identity, we started having multiple digital identities, and that creates a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge that you see in this digital identity space is the identity chaos. You have lots of users, lots of systems, uh, and many of you probably in different organizations, but uh, take for the financial sector, take for the educational sector, it doesn't matter. We have multiple repositories, multiple identities, and we tend to log into these multiple systems sometimes to do our day-to-day -day business, which is highly complex, and that creates a lot of challenge, and that also creates a lot of vulnerabilities that people can exploit or the attackers can exploit and launch attacks. We have multiple contexts, you know, we have employees, you know, so companies have employees and you have your customers, you have your suppliers, you have your partners, and 
COVID has taught us we have large number of remote employees, even you know, post COVID, many organizations tend to have large group of remote employees working, trying to log into their suppliers networks, their partners, and to their corporate networks. So the importance of digital identity has become much more important going forward after the COVID, because we seems to be decentralized, we seem to be distributed, we seem to integrate somehow with many of our suppliers, partners, and we're still using some of the older technologies that are out there. And that's where there are multiple cybersecurity challenges we are encountering in this space. So is this going to scale? So currently we spend around 16 minutes today logging on, which many of you might have realized when you try to log into multiple systems, you have different login IDs and passwords and you will go and log into them. That creates you know, so many minutes a day trying to spend in terms of logging into multiple systems. We have multiple identities, a home user to log into your you know, laptops, to your mobile phones, to your smart devices, you know, smart speakers, smart locks, and IP cameras. We all have different ways of accessing those Internet of Things devices. So the biggest challenge we've seen is these, some of these devices have been used as part of the financial services, next generation financial services, which means it's becoming more and more challenging for the financial service to manage these devices when even their own employees are distributed across in different uh, territories. So identity laws and the meta system. So the initial way the identity meta system was defined, you have an end user, then you have the identity provider, and then you have the relying parties. So normally there were multiple identity providers. For example, in the UK, we tried to have something called the Verify UK program, where we tried to bring the financial services industry, the government, as well as some of the other well-known entities which were trustworthy by the citizens. But the biggest challenge was the citizens or individuals never trusted any of these organizations. Okay, there is a level of trust with the uh, banks because they kind of protect our you know, finances, but there was no way of having multiple identity providers who were trusted by every citizen in the in European Union, for example. And then you have the relying parties, which are the online services, which actually you get. So the user gets into the identity provider, try to establish some form of identity, and then goes into the relying parties to your online services. So this is the meta system. You have the identity providers which issue some kind of identities, and then you use those identities and go and do some kind of online uh, business. So the law of identity, even at 2005, which is 17 years ago, defined by Microsoft, uh, by Kim Cameron, who said, it has to be user control and consent. And even 17 years ago, we decided we should somehow have, the user should have control and consent, and we should have minimum disclosure. So these were some of the challenges we had. We were not given the total control, and you, we were not given the power to only minimally disclose. If you look at the financial services sector today, you are, it's a still very old framework. They still look at ways of establishing and onboarding a customer still based around your paper records. You need to send your utility bill, you need to send your passport copies, you need to send your driving license. So still it's a very broken system. And this is where the disruption will happen through the digital identity moving forward. And these are the other laws, which was it, that human should be part of this design, directed identity, where should be an identity for everybody, and there should be pluralism of operators, and it should be consistent experience across different contexts. So there are different components. If you look at the digital identity, you have the single sign-on. Many of you use today the single sign-on system, federation, role management, authorization, web service, digital rights management, PKI directories. So there are multiple entities creating these different meta systems and you somehow have these things in silos sitting and working by themselves. And that is creating a lot of vulnerabilities moving into you know, something like the financial services sector. 
So remember that we are still in an environment where we have multiple identities, and that is a broken system that we need to somehow fix to move forward in an integrated fashion. So if you look at the evolution of the identity management system, we were initially in the centralized identity model where there was a centralized authority which act as an issuer of this digital identity. Then they moved into federated identity. Many of us use today going into a federation model where multiple service providers form the federation, which means things like we go into, you know, either go into Google sign on, Facebook sign on, and we then get access to multiple services. But where we are moving from a centralized and federated identity model, we are now moving into what is known as the decentralized identity model, something which is the self-sovereign identity or SSI. And I think this is where technology such as blockchain is enabling this decentralized identity platform. So we can actually have the next generation of internet, which is decentralized and giving more user control and user-centric uh, transactions. So if you look at the different forms of identity, we all have, you know, as humans or as things, we have set of attributes. So we either inherit them by gender, height, weight, or some of our capabilities, or they are assigned because we work someone, citizenship, nationality. So these are the kind of different ways they have been used to authenticate and authorize. Then going on from different forms, we are going more into biometrics and we are now very confident going, if you look you know, 20, 25 years ago, biometric was something we had so many false positives, we're not able to use them in terms of uh, for financial sector, but biometrics has taken over in the last five years plus and going into many of these financial transactions and you're trying to onboard customers using biometric authentication and validation process these days. Then you're using these kind of different forms of identity to provide different access control. So things like attribute based access control, location based and context based. These are some of these things which are coming up in the financial services sector to minimize the level of fraud. So initially, if we look at the way in which you know, we were trying to authenticate us was used around you know, something you know, which is the passwords, which still seems to be the most popular way and the pins and patterns. And then we go into something you have, such as hardware, keys, passwords, NFCs, and moving forward, we are something you are, biometric face, iris, fingerprint, and voice. But what we see moving forward, we still, although we have, you know, most of you will have apps, I think that's something the COVID has taught us, even the UK, if you look at, you know, before COVID, we had something like 14% of the population was using mobile banking, but during COVID and post COVID, we have around 68% using mobile banking, but still one of the frustration with mobile banking is you keep touching with your fingerprints or your facial recognition, and still there is there are challenges that you come with some of these hard biometrics. The system doesn't still allow you to go. So you still expected to give the pins or passwords to bypass whenever the biometric fails. So what I'm going to introduce here today is something known as a new sensing and processing, which is based around what else we have on top of all these, what you know and what you have and uh, something you have. But what's interesting in the financial services sector, things like Alexa now is coming. Alexa opened my bank, uh, banking app on Alexa. Can you transfer money from bank account A to bank account uh, B? So recently there is a lot of push around coming up with voice activated financial services so that you can get more personalized uh, banking services based around the uh, voice biometrics. And you clearly see there's a huge trend of growth in the terms of biometrics, voice biometrics. So what is the challenge with the current trend of using username and passwords? There is some stats, which we all love to see some stats. Still people use very you know, standard passwords. I'm sure you know, many of us are here, but if I ask you, there are 50 types of passwords many of us use, and you will see many of you will be using some combination of these passwords, which are widely used uh, repeatedly. So passwords are very repeated, used, reused, and they are shared with people. They are poorly chosen, 
and there's a challenge when people have given a certain limitation to how long you can have a password. They tend to go in rounds and they tend to come back with the same password. Some providers tend to provide you how many times you can use the same password and people just start changing just the numbers at the end. So there is a limited amount of combination. Our cognitive behavior doesn't allow us to you know, go beyond the limits we have because we still want to remember. If we cannot remember, then we start writing these passwords up or we keep a password folder in our desktop or mobile phones where we tend to have it you know, somewhere stored. So they are prone to all type of known attacks. So what we are trying to go forward for the next generation and look at things like continuous authentication, which provides secure and usable authentication. So for the banking sector, this is something that's going to be really cool because you're going to be continuously being authenticated based around some of these things that I'm going to talk about. So what is continuous authentication? It actually collects different types of physiological and behavior biometrics. So even if I have, if an attacker tries to get hold of your device, because we are going to have multiple devices where you will be accessing our banks from Alexa to our mobile phones to our smart speakers, we will be collecting this physiological data on top of it. There is a lot of work done around gamma rays, beta rays, using your smart headsets and using earbuds, which actually can monitor your physiological signals such as EEG and PPG, which the system will learn, the system you use will use these bio behavior biometrics and physiological biometrics to continuously authenticate you based around these different attributes that is collecting in, in real time. So which means that even if a hacker steals my device, he's not going to be able to replicate all these physiological data that has been collected over a period of time. So this is something that is going to be uh, very attractive going forward. So why the continuous authentication is becoming very popular, you know, you see with your mobile device and other devices, there's all kinds of sensors. We have done tons of research and we have done patents in this area to show how we can continuously authenticate using this behavior and physiological parameters using multimodal biometrics, combining the soft and the uh, hard biometric features. So looking at the role of identity, there is a important aspect in terms of the social impact, economic impact of inclusion. So the World Bank has identified three overarching goals, which is based around, you know, you need to give access to all. So a lot of the UK traditional banks struggled through the time when a lot of refugees from Afghan tried to come into the UK. The government wanted the traditional UK banks to provide financial services so that they can sign up and get their benefits from the government in the UK. But since these refugees who travel from Afghanistan, they didn't have any paper forms, the traditional banking system is still very old. It doesn't have anything that's disruptive. So they had major challenge in terms of having an inclusivity because they couldn't actually sign any of these refugees that were coming in from Afghanistan at that time. So we are now in a crisis. We'll have so many thousands into Europe coming with, you know, with no digital document, just walking through the borders. And we have to somehow manage these people, providing them you know, all different types of services, including financial services. So how are we going to manage these people? So this is where having a digital identity that you can carry it with you, walking across the borders, you are not worried about paper document, it goes with you, which is spatial temporal, and you have it with you all the time, that's going to transform the way the financial services industry will go in the next 10 years. We are going to a zero trust model. It's an open network model, you know, this means you know, we don't trust anybody. We need to establish trust. We are going into seamless environment. We need to have security beyond boundaries. We cannot have perimeters anymore. We have been learning this during lockdown. We have been moving banking staff, investment banking or traditional retail banking. Staff were working remotely from offices. They were working with devices. They were working with all the different distributor systems in the bank 
using home network and trying to log into the corporate network. Some of them go through VPN networks, some of them bypass the security because there were a lot of hindrance when you go through security. So when you go to, I think COVID has taught us a lot of interesting things. And this is where things like zero trust model, how do we continue to establish ourselves again, different systems. And this is where, you know, we are very aware of IoT or internet of things in the consumer area, which is in our home environment. I recently wrote a document for the government about IoT for enterprises and financial service is a sector where we see the internet of things will transform the way the financial services will operate. So we are going to have a way to establish the trust when we're seamlessly moving beyond this traditional perimeter of security. So the zero trust architecture is just in time, providing access at the right time, right user, right permission between not just the user, it's also the devices. So when you look at the identity, it's not just identifying yourself, it's also identifying the devices. We are going to be using multiple dif different devices, as I said, you know, smart devices like smart speakers, smart cameras, smart mobiles, and uh, Alexa you know, to do financial services going forward. And we will be seamlessly moving from one space to the other space, which means from a physical phase to the logical space. And we need to somehow translate from the physical to the logical identity. So we are moving into an area where we are defining what is known as the self-sovereign identity, which gives you the decentralized identity model. The beauty of the SSI or self-sovereign identity, it gives these 10 principles, which means coexistence. So users, it's all user. If you see, it started with user must have an independent user must control the identity, user must have access to their own data. And this is a challenge when a lot of banks had a lot of control of how they did things. And now the user is being empowered through the self-sovereign identity, which gives you interoperability, portability and constant and minimizations. One of the questions I ask to even the audience here, when you go to the data minimizations, why do banks keep asking things that are not needed? How do we minimize the amount of identity data that we share with the bank? So data minimization is a important and an interesting aspect going forward. So this is where the SSI, which is the decentralized model actually gives you the decentralized identifier. And it also gives you the, what is known as verifiable credentials. So our identities will be verified but we as a user will be able to decide how I use and how I share my credentials across with different parties. So the, I think Theo spoke a lot about it. We are going through having digital wallets. So this is where we are seeing that, how do we have digital wallets? So me as a user will be able to share which kind of transaction when I'm with a financial service and what kind of you know, credentials or digital identities I want to share with which entity from my digital wallet. So to overcome some of the current challenges around vendor lock-in, centralized uh, identity repositories, we are moving more towards the decentralized model where we will have multiple wallets and we will be able to go into different financial services using these wallets we will carry with us. So that why blockchain? I think already nicely, Theo has touched around it, gives all these different properties. So what we see is there are a lot of these uh, identity management providers from blockchain community coming from Hyperledger, Indy, Sovereign Foundation, Evanim, Hadera, Hashgraph, EarthID, sort of multi of these companies coming in and trying to provide these services which are decentralized in the financial services sector. So moving forward, it's not, as I keep saying, it's not just the individuals, it's also managing the identity of things. So financial services is a sector, we'll see multiple devices to onboard customers. How do you trust the camera that's taken a picture of myself to onboard a customer? In the UK, there are multiple banks now of which are you know, trying to be now high street banks, but they were initially app-based banks. They were taking pictures from your mobile app to onboard you in two minutes, unlike the traditional bank, which took you sometimes one month or 
uh, two months to establish your identity because you are from another country, you came into the UK and you tried to open up a bank account. So things like Starling banks, Monzo bank, you know, uh, call banks, and all these banks have become very disruptive onboarding customer based around using facial identity. But then how do you trust these devices where these facial identities have been taken and how then these identities are stored and shared with the financial services. There is a huge challenge of maintaining the credibility of these identities and the security, integrity, privacy, and trust. So that's where blockchain is a platform where this will be enabled going forward. So just to summarize where we are going to go with the future of identity. I think we spoke a lot around in the last talk and this one about digital wallets. Uh, metaverse, so we see metaverse, Facebook is going to disrupt the metaverse. We are going to be doing trading. They're going to have banking. There's going to be very limited boundary between you know, the physical world we are banking today, the online world and the metaverse where we'll be in the virtual world doing trading, doing crypto trading, using digital currency, using NFTs. So for NFTs, identity will be a very, very important aspect because there'll be a lot of transactions which will be high value transactions. Then I think Theo has spoken a lot about cross-border payments. Again, that is an interesting aspect of you know, how cross-border payments are gonna happen with you know, digital currencies. Again, things around cross-border identity verification. How do you, so European Commission using the EDAS framework is actually now pushing for a digital identity that could be shared for all kind of financial transaction across European borders. There's a big challenge in terms of supply chain and open banking. Yeah. So we have to really somehow come with the digital currencies, how we are going to manage the challenges around open banking. One of the challenges as a researcher I have seen, when you go for native clouds, when you go for delivering banking services on the cloud, you are trying to open up different API to third party services. And this is where many of the traditional banks are very resistant to opening up the APIs to third parties because they think if something happens and if there's a vulnerability, if there is an attack that's launched in the supply chain of them having multiple suppliers in the open banking, then who is responsible? So there is a huge challenge in terms of the regular the banking from the regulator. So we have seen the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. Then the PSD2 came in and that pushed banks to have a lot of challenge in terms of how they manage this privacy of the data. And now you think, see things like DORA, which means banks are pushed to share the data. So they like to have competition in the marketplace, but at the same time, the data has to be securely and shared in a privacy preserving manner in a competitive environment. So it's a huge challenge. And you are coming up with things like, you know, somebody asked the question about quantum computing. Yes, but I think things like, you know, in futuristic, if you look at in the banking platform, they are already work done in terms of applying homomorphic encryption, which will bypass many of the, you know, threats that we see with the traditional security uh, cryptographic protocols today. So going into doing business analytics into fully homomorphic encryption, it's a place where quantum computers can go and do online trading. So, you know, we need to somehow have financial inclusion and I see for financial inclusion, open banking is going to provide the platform for financial inclusion because I've seen already it's proving that they are overcoming some of the barriers that has been posed by the traditional banking sector in terms of how they onboard a new customer. And especially with, you know, a lot of, Students, for example, coming into UK, a lot of refugees we manage in the UK. The way forward is to, you know, go into disruptive uh, open banking initiatives. And on top of it, then you have the challenge from how do you share safely and securely the customer's personal data. So I spoke about it, the PSD2, which is the Payment Services Directive, which is putting a lot of pressure on the financial services sector together with the GDPR and other regulations in terms of the banking such as the DORA is putting a lot of challenge in terms of cybersecurity and how banks are going to protect the data when they go for the open banking initiatives 
in the next few years. So identity will play a very crucial role and we, many of you might have seen players like uh, Onfido is playing a big role in using facial recognition for onboarding customers. And as I already mentioned, it takes up to two minutes to onboard new customers so that you know, they are very disruptive in the marketplace. The biggest challenge is you know, the banks are not willing to share. And I think Theo already mentioned very nicely about data custodians. So somehow the banks are pushed to the limits. They have to, the, the traditional high street banks have to somehow find ways to share this data. But if you look at the identity model, it is going from centralized identity model through to the decentralized identity model where we can do cross-border transactions so that things like KYC, AML, and all these can be addressed. And even on the onboarding process, I work with a company called Thirdfoot to onboard customers for you know, real estates. And they have cut the time from a traditional bank to purchase a new house, which takes between six weeks to two hours. It just goes and flies different scripts, collects all the different uh, checks for AML, and it validates and says, yes, it's a genuine transaction. And the lawyers are really loving this kind of platforms because it's onboarding customers so quickly and then checking for AML, and then the customer is able to purchase the house fairly quickly, unlike in the traditional system where it's very slow. So these are the kind of companies that are coming up in the open banking space, and they will encourage more data sharing between competitors. And in the privacy preserving, you see already companies like Facebook, Google, they are under a lot of pressure to work on the data they collect in a privacy preserving manner. So decentralization actually allows you to train even models so that the AI algorithms are not biased and the data is shared in a unbiased and in an ethical sense, because you have to be ethically correct and you have to be not biased. So gender biased and all these things can be overcome using some of these decentralized frameworks that are coming or moving forward into the financial sector. And the, if you look at the standardizations going forward, we already seen the four ID4D, which is saying by 2030, the United Nations want you know, everybody on the planet to have a legal identity. So for example, you take India, Atta card is taking, it's a classic example of identity, how identity can overcome corruption. With other now identity biometrics has been used to, for anything from tax to other purposes. It's overcome many of the corruptions that you saw in the Indian context, and it works with a population of 1.2 billion. And many countries, including US and all of Europe, is translating this traditional ID into the you know, future identity, which is the decentralized identity framework. So in terms of the, the digital identity framework for having ID wallet, there are currently across Europe by end of 2020, there were 19 digital identity schemes that were interoperable. Uh, just uh, this year, the UK has now got the identity framework finally. UK has struggled to have a typical identity framework, but now we have identity certificate providers, which can actually certify different identity providers, which means then they become trusted entities of users of online services. And once that's done, then you can go and do online services securely using these trusted certificates. So the user, the beauty of the SSI is the identity entities that you are interacting with is only selective disclosure, which means you're not sharing anything about it. So it's a privacy preserving identity. So you are only giving the information that is needed. You're not giving anything. So it's a privacy is protected and it's decentralized and it's on the blockchain. So it's going to overcome many of the challenges we have seen in terms of you know, money laundering, in terms of trustworthy systems, in terms of decentralizations. So you saw in the presentation at Theo, he took us from 2.0 to web 3.0. I see we are going from web 3.0 to web 4.0, where we are going to have 6G, decentralized model, quantum computing, online trading, online gamification, 
AR, VR for banking. And I don't know if, if you have seen the next generation mobile phones from iPhone is going to be with no screens. So it'll be voice activated. All the transition will be based on voice and we will not have a screen to type things. And that is going to take us through a lot of these interesting times. We are, you know, across the world. This is an example of Europe, but there is Australia, you know, there is Singapore, there is rest of the world that's using these frameworks, there is standards. So we never had standards around some of these things for interoperability, and that's where the challenge. But COVID taught us we had IATA mobile ID for traveling across the world. So there is these kind of IDs, digital IDs are coming in app that you can use it for many of these services going forward. And you see, just to summarize that we have so many different uh, identity providers which are coming in. Some are onboarding customers based around individuals. Some are onboarding customers based around the behavior of the device and the behavior of the individual. So moving forward, we will have a continuous authentication and we'll make the life very difficult for the, the cyber criminals, which means there'll be very attractive solutions in the on banking, uh, moving forward with open banking, and there'll be a lot of disruption we will see with things like quantum computing, metaverse, and also the digital currency. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Very interesting. Um, there are a couple of questions, but I think we should move to the um, panel now and we can take those uh, in between. So uh, please allow me now to invite all our panelists uh, on uh, stage. And uh, I will introduce also Dr. Uh, Periclis Thiveos and Ms. Julia, uh, Julia George. So Julia is a highly experienced uh, board strategy and uh, information technology consultant engaged by organizations of all sizes and types to challenge and develop strategy to realize stakeholder benefits. Julia's career has been primarily focused on the financial services sector. She's a charter fellow at the, of the CSI, a court library, library man of the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists, where as chair of the Financial Services Technologies Panel, she has led initiatives on ESG, cybersecurity skills, and operational resilience. She's a founding trustee of Red Trouser Day, raising funds for bowel cancer research, where she developed a strategy to achieve full charitable status. She's currently the strategy lead and non-executive non director of a startup technology company. And uh, Barry Gliss, he's a uh, founding partner of True North Partner LLP and Boutique Financial uh, Services Advisory Firm, headquartered in London. His experience transcends uh, finance, risk, and strategy for financial institutions, focusing on risk and regulation, financial technology, digital currencies, reference rate transition, counterparty credit risk, securitization, and structured products. Bericlis has lived uh, and worked in London, New York, Toronto, Johannesburg, all over the world, Bericlia, and has executed projects in several other cities in Europe, North and South uh, America, Africa, and the Middle East. He's the founder of two successful companies in the field of finance and two firms in retail and hospitality as well as the CFO of a startup focusing on renewable energy uh, microgrids. So thank you all, Perigli. If you can turn on your camera also, please. And uh... So I need to have the camera enabled centrally. It's locked by the administrator. Okay, Valentino, please. Thank you all for joining this. Um, panel. And of course, a big thank you to all of our participants coming from all over the world. Um, Valentino, please, the camera, please. Okay. Yep, we can see you. Okay, great. So 
let me start with a couple of uh, questions that uh, I have before we start taking um, some of the other questions. I will start actually with um, Theodosi. I mean, of course, everybody can uh, answer. And uh, just if you briefly can explain to us how blockchain can assist in providing security and trust in the financial services. Thank you, Sula, for the question. So uh, as I've mentioned in the slides before, uh, blockchain is based on combining some cryptographic primitives, uh, which are like studied for, for many, many years, and we know their properties, for example, hash functions for immutability, digital signature for non-repudiation. And the way these uh, uh, cryptographic primitives are being uh, implemented into the blockchain architecture, it makes it to inherit these properties. This is pretty much, it's not that blockchain is something magical that gives us these properties. It's about the cryptographic primitives, the way we deploy them to, uh, and, and they have these properties. So security, by the way, it's also very like difficult where to quantify. I think it's secure, all of you know. I mean, we deploy best practices and blockchain because has many moving parts. It's something that we see attacks at different levels, at application level, algorithm design level, game theory level, many different type of att attacks. The trust, however, comes from the ledger and the, from the way the system is governed through, through encoding. Everything is transparent and we know exactly what's happening. So th this is what the blockchain space can bring into the financial sector. Thank you, Theodosi. Anybody else would like to comment on that? Then uh, I will be moving to the next uh, question. It seems that um, this wave uh, of decentralization that we have uh, led uh, by technology and uh, the, the rest of the uh, technologies that we see in the, co uh, the convergence, I would say, of technologies, break down current organizational uh, silos that often create risk gaps that fall uh, between departments. Anybody would like to comment on that? Well, I can take take that one to start with. Um, Thank you. From my experience, um, technology platforms, we, we've been through centralization, decentralization. I'm old enough to remember all of it. And one of the things that is often missing is a real appreciation of technology in the boardroom, which actually creates an issue. Um, and I think the key thing for me is as we move the transition from you know, from current structures, and a lot of organizations are still within current structures. We also have um, a lot of startups now um, that are using this wonderful new technology, but even as they interact with real world, as they interact with uh, a humanity that is split between highly technically enabled people and then poor people all over the world who do not have access, full access to technology. It's that transition that worries me. And some of the main players, when I say main players, I mean the existing banks, financial services players, um, are still operating to some extent in silos. So we have quite a lot to break down before we can deliver blockchain technology and the trust that it, it promises. Um, so I suppose I'd give that over to my colleagues on the panel on the uh, panel to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank Andy, you. But yes, uh, yes. just to echo what Julia said, that there is a lot of resistance within the major high street banks to open up things uh, and you see a lot of innovative tech out there uh, but I still see that it is educating this C-level team that who understands there is more opportunities if they don't do it but obviously it is uh, the big elephant in the room which has all the power at the moment to centralize things but there is a push from regulator through this open banking now to decentralized and open up the APIs. So recently we have been looking at some of the existing APIs that's been provided by some of the open banking platforms. Uh, and we were looking at some web logic stuff and we were running some APIs that were provided and they said, sorry, the biggest challenge with this kind of 
uh, open banking APIs is they are not protected. They are providing a service, but they are not secure enough for us to open up. So what I see it, although decentralized should happen and they'll be, they'll be forced to do it, at the moment, the major high street banks are still very much resisting to open up these APIs. They still want to, and I think in a way they see that they are going to lose the control. The customers are going to be all over. And I think the open banking will give a lot of personalization. So I will go in, I'll, I'll, I'll pick and mix. So there is no vendor lock-in at the moment. I go into one bank. I tend to be locked in with the same high street bank for many things because they have a history of my data. So they can give me a loan quickly. They can give me a mortgage, which means that I'm sometimes paying 6% when an open banking, new innovation open banking platform is giving it for 2%. So, so they don't want to give it, but I'm locked in at the moment because of my historical data that's held by the bank. I'm able to get a loan or a mortgage or any other benefit. But once that is changed, so the banks will release this data. I think once they release the data, I see they see that as a big challenge in terms of losing customers because customers are obviously for personalization and they are willing to go for its cost versus benefits. At the moment, you know, we all want to get benefits, but at the same time, cost is a factor. So with some of these onboarding processes, I see some of the innovative you know, platforms in the open banking space, they're very disruptive, got very amazing VR technologies, very amazing onboarding customers, we don't need to have this kind of traditional scanned photocopies of bank statements, which basically is stupid. You want to open up a second bank statement. You still have to provide your bank statement for the last three months. What is the purpose of getting a copy of my bank statement when I already banked with you? Yeah. So there's a lot of this legacy process that needs to be you know, removed. And I think this is where I'm up for this, all these new banks that are coming up in the open banking space. Uh, thank you, Raj. Yes, indeed, there is a lot of all these old processes that it seems to me that, uh, you know, they're just refusing to let go. Um, so, I mean, what, what governments uh, could do in relation to these aspects or maybe the central banks and in addition also to secure, um, to develop a secure ecosystem in which uh, to optimize all these different opportunities that are laying ahead of us. I think this is, I'll, I'll just say my couple of words and I'll shut up after that. But I think things like DORA and uh, for example, in the UK, we have Cyber Essential Plus now. And then ISO 27001 is there in terms of proving that. So I think there's a lot of regulatory and compliance issues from uh, in the UK, the ICO, in the European Commission, you have the GDPR on top of DORA and also PSD2. So I think that's forcing a lot of banks to take measures so that they protect customer data. And once they show that they are protecting this kind of data, then they are going to open up, you know, now you guys need to stand, you know, open this data for third parties. So there is more competition in the marketplace. Then the competition authority will push the banks to open this up to new players coming in. And that's what's going to be very disruptive uh, from my view here yeah thank you raj anybody else would like to comment on this no i completely want to echo what raj just said um, it is really important to have standards and i'm not saying that necessarily the government is the right source of standards but mm -hmm. it is one of the sources and it's one of the sources of open standards standards that do not have to be bought for or that they're not they do not get developed necessarily out of market dominance uh, just a quick comment as well on what has been said before. I completely agree with what Julia said. We need to take into account the sociology of technology. Technology doesn't stand in a vacuum. And allow me to be a little bit deviant here and say, similarly to the example where you have a boardroom that doesn't get technology, I've also been into boardrooms of startups or other companies, not necessarily that young, where the board thought that technology is going to solve aspect, uh, problems on its own. And that is also something we need to be careful about. Whether we want to look at decentralized finance or any other application of blockchain is not just blockchain as a technology that's going to achieve our needs, but the ability to create a network of actors, if I may start using this language, that trust the technology, but also trust themselves outside the realm of the, the technology that we're studying. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to comment on this? Uh, there is an interesting question on uh, the chat that I see here in relation also to what uh, we're discussing. It says, um, 
blockchain and crypto integration and adoption is still a major problem in Africa, Botswana to be precise, as there are still no legal frameworks to put in place to regulate such. What do you think can be done to help speed up the integration because this is where the world is going? I'm gonna comment, I've, I've, I've lived for quite some time just right south of the border of Botswana, so I'm gonna take that opportunity. Um, I totally appreciate the need for some standards and ideally we can have some, I would rather say policies rather than laws, but again, we're going into now the fine, tune, the fine print. Um, there's enough information in the public domain that can be used by companies in Botswana, in Namibia, wherever in the world, even if that's not regulatory imposed, it can still form some sort of standard that we can start following. We can see what is happening in other countries. It's great if our regulator picks the right standards to impose. Again, we need to be careful. They may also pick up the wrong standards, but there is enough information in the public domain so that even in places where there's not actually an internal lead, that's not the problem. Information sharing is not an issue anymore. Uh, if there's a startup down in, in, in any country in the world that they do not feel that they have enough local guidance, I'm sure there's enough of international guidance that we can start using. In the end, the standards, I mean, I, I say it's nice to have standards, but uh, I alluded to often standards get developed by the market itself and by practice. So if we don't have the one, let's work on the other one. Thank you, Berigli. Anybody else would like to comment on this or? Then uh, I will continue with another question uh, that I have here and move a little bit into all DeFi. Uh, we see that um, several DeFi hacks, uh, they have been reported in uh, 2020, attacks that perhaps uh, within uh, the traditional financial system would probably be impossible. How should the firm protect both itself and its customers from such uh, issues? Theodosi, perhaps you want to take this? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, regarding, I mean, this goes back to what, I, what I've mentioned before. It's uh, still a blockchain. It has many moving parts. It's still code that developers write, groups from different uh, areas around, around the world, let's say. Uh, now they build bridges from one blockchain to other, so even more moving parts. Okay, so it's inevitable to have such type of attacks. Uh, what uh, the best practice is just to avoid many moving parts when you have an architecture, but we cannot uh, avoid 100% being exposed to such things and, until the space becomes more mature. Uh, there, there is no, there is, there is no solution. Yeah, Thank just, you. To, just to add to that, I think there is a, since I've just written a pro EU proposal around this stuff, it's uh, mm -hmm. hot on my head now. I think the, the next generation of decentralized internet has to have the social inclusions, the energy efficiency, the portability, the interoperability. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of expectation in terms. Of, so if you look at the EU, they want to have a tool, a common digital tool where that's standardized by September 2022. But I think it's still a major challenge. You know, we still don't have among even our countries having a specific ID that we can establish because there are so many services, we're still not really clear where the physical ID stops and where the, the digital ID takes over. So there is a mix and it's going to take a lot of challenge in terms of crossing the physical identity to the digital, uh, digital identity. So I think, one of the ways to look at it, there's a lot of push now around scanning. So the recently in the last five years, I've seen a lot of security companies have come in purely looking at financial API scans. So they purely scan APIs for onboarding new entities into the financial services supply chain. So most of the companies, they tend to see that the vulnerabilities come from the APIs that are being used to integrate new services into the existing banking platforms. So I think this is one way, but as Theo mentioned, it's very difficult to say that uh, you know, there is a lot of work done around cross-chain, yeah? how you move from one chain to the other chain and cross-chain itself has a big performance issue. So when you trade between performance versus interoperability versus you know, the cost, 
it's kind of a big challenge and we still don't have the numbers to really see which one works better. We are still trying to pilot. There are still multiple platforms uh, and they're moving very fast. So you start building one thing and you see Sovereign Foundation comes with a new thing, then Ethereum competes with it, moves from a proof, proof of stake with an extra add-on with an extension. So it's also, it's not something we are settling in and we are building for five years to see this is now concrete and it's not going to be, you know, susceptible to any type of cyber attacks. And that, you know, we are going to see some level of cyber attacks, but I think there is, there are things happening, but I think the regulatory and the open standards, I think standards is one thing we can, if things are standardized, then at least some level of things are done in a, in a privacy preserving, ethical AI, and then we are trying to make sure these platforms are secure in a manner that we all gone through a step of process. And that's where sometimes standardization and things like going through ISO 27001, 27002, which was recently revamped as well. It does help because it makes you to go through many of these controls and see that you are actually making sure all these are secure. Thank you, Raj. I absolutely agree uh, with you on this. Um, Another question now uh, that uh, we have I have here related on um, on the organizations them themselves, these uh, different uh, financial services uh, that we have at financial institutions. What can they do to train their people aclo across the organization, and uh, not just within the IT departments, and not only their people but also their customers? So, Lama, one of the things that, um, if I can take the first part of this, mm -hmm. is that um, I, there was a famous politician who once said, read my lips, it's the economy, stupid. And then as we have progressed, it's almost, I'm hearing, read my lips, it's technology. But actually, I think we're, we really need to take into account that humanity um, and our personality types and how we react. A lot of organizations have many, many hidden stresses. They don't really understand some of the hidden stresses in their, in their organization. And it is people who make mistakes. If you look at the statistics, phishing is very high, it, it's increasing. And why? Um, because usually somebody somewhere in the organization has slipped up. So for however good the technology gets, there's still room for slipping up. Um, so for me, I think it's about massive education starting from school, let alone university, and then coming up to organisations. It's having uh, boardrooms that are not just um, emotionally hooked into the stresses of their organization, but also are very, very technology savvy. And until we get there, then I think blockchain is a platform that will take too long to come in and create the trust that we've heard about today. So I'm a bit of a doomsayer on this, but um, that's an opinion I've formed over the last few years of watching the financial services industry. Um, thank you, Julia. And uh, anybody else would like to comment on this? I think I can comment on what I've seen recently in terms of regulatory tech is, so there are a lot of banks trying to put automated regulatory in place now, which means that I think we are trying to see if we can bypass some of this in-house knowledge. And as you rightly pointed out, and Julia here mentioned that, you know, as an educational institution, what I've been trying to do in the last six months or so is to work very closely with many banks and uh, open banking platforms to see how their staff can work on many projects with our students. So it's a two-way process. They educate us and we educate them because sometimes there is kind of a disconnect between what is taught in an institution. I think we, there are a lot of great academic stuff going on, mm -hmm. but this transferring the knowledge into purpose within the industry, there is a gap in this marriage between the real world and the... So what I've seen is bringing these industry professional talking to our students, defining specific projects in areas where there is you know, gap in the knowledge and then working together seems to be a better way for us to benefit for the shortcoming. And top of it, having automated regulated seems to be the best way forward. So you set all these controls, how you automate, so that at least you kind of tick the boxes for compliance because they are automated. So you somehow to some level, you protect yourself against you know, fines and things like that going forward. 
Um, thank you, Raj. Yes, and um, if I may also, you know, coming also from uh, an academic uh, uh, background, I think that even when uh, developing our own curriculum on these uh, different topics, we should get in uh, all different stakeholders involved, uh, from the industry to the um, policymakers, and of course to the uh, faculty that are actually going to be uh, developing and teaching these uh, courses and integrate uh, policymakers with and uh, the industry as much as we can within our lectures. Um, I will move a little bit now into um, digital uh, identities. It seems uh, to me that uh, there is also quite some interest in relation to uh, the self-sovereign identities and digital IDs. And one of the comments uh, that uh, we have here on the chat is that um, digital IDs will have challenges in applications uh, in remote uh, rural and uh, basic societies, which represent a huge sector of global population, especially in Africa and uh, fourth world economies, for example, Afghanistan, et cetera. And if, we, if you could comment on this. Yeah, I think uh, this is where I see with the penetration of smartphones. So this is an area I worked a lot with India. When I went with the mobile banking platform 17 years ago to India, I was told, professor coming from London with a smartphone, it doesn't work in the rural setting in India. But I think in the last 15 years plus, the penetration of mobile phones, and even you know, at that time, the Nokia handset, which we call the brick phone today, was the what, but I was told I should build my technology around. So I think the, the technology has moved in such a pace and everybody has access to some level of a mobile device, which can collect some form of the credentials, either it is from the fingerprints or facial. So I think, you know, as I said, a classic example is the author, which is the Indian digital ID, which seems to have overcome. And when I started working with India 20 years ago, there was a lot of corruption around, you know, in the panchayat, somebody will misuse your credentials to tax, file tax and go and take, you know, 10 tickets to travel because you only restrict the number of tickets on a first class train travel or something. But today with the digital ID, it is very hard to overcome some of these. So I see there is, you know, in Africa, in India, and some of these rural settings, there is a big takeover of these kind of technologies moving forward. And I think I'm also a fan of Elon Musk. And if you see, he is now bypassing the rural broadband, the challenges, he's using the satellites to provide broadband for all, you know, whether you're in the rural or in the city. So, I think we will kind of have some level of financial inclusion. I think still the challenges I see are from the politicians. It's a political agenda because when it comes to the political agenda, there is a lot of restrictions in terms of just letting people into the country. And I think this is where the digital ID and self-sovereign identity will play a major role so that we can seamlessly have a digital passport on our mobile phones. Uh, we will go through borders without standing in a queue with, you know, so we'll have, you know, amber, red and green where we'll bypass based around our digital profile. So one of the projects I'm involved now is to how to link our digital profile with our open source intelligence. So there is so much stuff about ourselves, about our digital ID. How do we actually verify ourselves so we can just walk through securely? Similarly, for the banking, the banks can use all this open source intelligence. We are in LinkedIn, we are in Facebook, we are in Twitter, we are in that, we are in the blog. We are, and I think that kind of, it's a very rich data that can, and this is the decentralized model. So I can decide that I want to share my blog data, I want to share this data, I want to share, so I can pick up multiple wallets and I can actually run. So I see with the penetration of smartphones into the rural world, that there is a great opportunity to bypass some of the traditional infrastructure where the old traditional banks operate to be very disruptive in the open banking space. Uh, thank you, Raj. And uh, I do agree also with you on, especially on the uh, smartphones. And I think this answers, this could be part of the answer to one of the comments that uh, we have here from, uh, from Alvaro. And he's saying that uh, in, uh, in Colombia and Ladam, they have over uh, plus or minus 650 million people out of which uh, a large percentage is illiterate in general and especially in technology. And how will uh, this current wave of technology affect the region as a whole? 
due to the lack of education and internet access at the same time. So this is a matter of adoption here, first of the internet, I believe, and then with the help of the internet, the online uh, education is uh, becomes much more easier. I'm not sure if anybody would like to comment on that. I think in terms of the languages, I've seen a lot of, uh, I worked with a couple of companies who do voice translation. So they do voice to text translation. So mm -hmm. it bypasses the barrier in terms of people's understanding. So how do you bypass people kind of follow English language, for example? Uh, so I think the way the metaverse is taking over in terms of how Samsung and Apple are working towards, you don't need the screen. It's all going to be personalized, voice activated, command based going forward. So. I think we will come in a generation where we will use our personal voices, which means that we don't need to be literate enough to how to, so we will say things and we'll have enough training. And I think, I don't like to keep throwing the word of AI and machine learning, but I think we are going into a generation there is enough tech out there, which could help the humans to uh, teach the systems, which is the you know interface that which humans the machines will understand humans and there'll be a very small boundary between humans and the machines going forward. And I think this is what the metaverse is about. You know, We'll go from the physical world to the virtual world, we'll play games, we'll do online transaction, we'll go to the bar, we'll go to the pub, we'll go to social networking, we'll come out and we are back in the physical world. And I think this is where you know, we will not be challenged by the language or the... So I think there is an opportunity here to overcome the challenges today in terms of the inclusivity and the how to alleviate poverty in some sections. Uh, I think that the mobile phones has given all these an opportunity. And I think big players, a lot of things like the, the Microsoft Foundation and Facebook and uh, people like that, uh, how they are doing you know, broadband for all in certain parts of the world. I think this should translate or transform the future of inclusive society. So we are getting there. But as I said, the politicians are there. We need to overcome many of the regulatory and the political challenges, as I said. Thank you, Raj. We are left only with a few minutes. So, so uh, first, uh, before I thank, well, thank you all for being here, uh, especially our presenters and the panelists. Um, some final thoughts so uh, that you would like to share with us, with uh, our audience from all the panelists, please. Berkeley. Right. Uh, maybe let's just not forget about humans when we talk about technology. Uh, I've been around in financial services for 20 years. And just like Julia mentioned earlier, very often we just jump on whichever technology mm -hmm. uh, and we think it's going to be the new something. But I hope that we're not going to see for another time the new segue or something similar like this, right? Uh, profits of success are too easy to come by, especially in a world of incredible technological enthusiasm. Sometimes we get to see technology as the, so, there's the silver bullet or some specific technologies that are the silver bullets. For technologies to succeed, we need to make the, the network, the ecosystem to use that word. I'm not a big fan of it, but the ecosystem around it, we need to make it work with technology and be helped by technology. Um, Thank you. I think uh, from, from my angle, I think as uh, you know, we are just talking here, the last European call was human-centric, decentralized, next-generation internet. So this was the last call from European Commission. So I totally agree. It has to be human-centric, human control, decentralization, and that's the future internet. This is the way I think we will, humans will play a major role. And I think it, this is what even Tim Berners-Lee says today, we move too fast. When he started internet, we never thought we will come to where we are today. So he is working on his big project today in terms of decentralization and human centric. And I think that's the future. Um, thank you. Thank you, Raj. Yes. Uh, Julia? Um, I just wanted to agree very much with Barry Gliese and also with, with Raj. Um, I think having finished my last comment with being a doomsayer, I think um, we can be very optimistic about our world because, Today's generation is, is 
really, really technologically driven and tech savvy. Um, so as, as long as we put the right surrounding tools and also security around them, um, we, should, we should do very well, I think. If I may add, Julia, and the right priorities, and Definitely. humanity is our priority. Well, funny you should say that. Another comment is that there is a huge uh, focus on ESG, environmental, social and governance, which obviously we didn't really cover today as such, but um, huge debate around that. But I think a lot of young people are so awake to that that they won't let us carry on and, and just spoil everything. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Any last uh, thoughts from anybody else? Theodosi? Yes, from my side, uh, I, I would say that don't be scared of this attack, as the Raj mentioned, are inevitable. Uh, make sure that you follow best practices. I mean, wh when it comes up with technology and hopefully after some years, these best practices will be enough to protect us. And I'm sure that uh, blockchain is the future for, for finance. I'm, I'm not saying just replacing everything, but it will improve definitely. It's accepted by all governments around the world. Thank you, Theodosi. Another big thank you to all of you and our audience for being here with us. So stay tuned for our upcoming uh, online sessions again in collaboration with City University of uh, London and uh, our face-to-face uh, um, -face conference, which will take place in December uh, 15 and 16. So thank you all. I'm Professor Sula Luga from the University of Nicosia, uh, the head of the, uh, the Digital Innovation Department and one of the directors at the Institute for the Future. Thank you very much. Bye to all. Good night and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.